Good evening, parents. Thank you so much for joining us. We are all here excited to see you today. Uh, we have a great special presenter today, as well as our dynamic principals as usual. Um, it is now 531 and we're gonna get ahead and get started. I got a few updates. Uh, if there are any parents who are still in need of the Comcast Wi-Fi, we still have a Comcast uh, a program going on for free Wi-Fi. If anybody needs that, just uh, send me an email at williamsk at channelparkacademy.net. Again, williamsk at channelparkacademy.net. If you are in need or know someone at, that goes to school is in need of I mean, a free Wi-Fi service. Also, you'll see in the chat, um, parents, we are asking you if your child is not feeling well, uh, to please keep them at home to help us uh, try to navigate this COVID process. If your child is not feeling well, keep them at home until you know that they are good to return back to school. And if you uh, have get uh, your student has, is getting a COVID test, uh, wait until your results come back before you return them back to school. Any questions about this, you can call Nurse Mills. Her phone number is inside the chat to get any questions about the COVID protocol, how we do things, or just questions about your child being sick and should they come or not come to school. She sent me an email today to, to make sure the parents can give her a call and that way she can inform you on what, whether the child should stay at home or come to school. So again, if your students have any kind of illness, don't feel well, feel sick, just keep them at home. We better be safe than sorry. That way we can help you can, you can help the school stop the spread of the virus inside the school. All right. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over. If any uh, parents, as you know, we, we have all the questions at the end of the session. So if you have a question for the principals, all three of them, and Ms. Brooks, our presenter for tonight, just put them in the chat. And when we get towards the end of the meeting, we'll come back and uh, discuss your questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson, all, it's all you. Um, good evening, parents. Uh, welcome to this month's PPM meeting. Um, um, the only updates that I have um, is tomorrow um, we're going to be hosting our um, kindergarten and first grade literacy um, parent workshop. Uh, Mrs. Vietto is going to be going over some strategies um, that students can use at home. And of course, um, just like every year, we, are, we will be providing um, each student some resources that they can use at home um, just to make sure that we're encouraging that um, 25 to 30 minutes reading per day. Um, we know that when students are reading 25 to 30 minutes per day, it's going to create um, increase their academic level. Um, and so we want to make sure that all of our students are reading at grade level or above. Um, on next Thursday, the 28th, we have our annual trunk or treat. Um, so flyers have been sent out um, for individuals, for parents who wanna open their trunk um, and also parents who want to just participate and just send, send the $5 in. Um, so that's gonna be at 5 p.m. in the back. Um, all parents that are going to participate would need to make sure that they register. Um, and again, either by opening your trunk or sending in the money to participate. And last but not least, on the 29th, um, next, next Friday, we're gonna be doing a fundraiser, um, a dress down fundraiser um, for to expose our students to um, the college um, experience we're having a dress down fundraiser where students can dress down in either Michigan or Michigan State apparel or colors. Um, we, we can encourage the students to not only dress down, but we want them to bring a fun fact about that college. Again, just making sure that our elementary students are exposed to um, um, college and, and college and universities. Um, that is all. If you have any questions, um, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat. Thanks. Mr. Anderson, quick question. Uh, how would parents register for the trunk or treat? What, what's that process? It's a flyer that went out with their student gotcha. or they can contact the main office. Okay. So okay. They, they need that flyer. So the flyer went out with the students. Um, okay. They can also contact, the parents can also contact the homeroom teacher if you need an, an additional flyer. Okay. And uh, one other question, that reading initiative, 
25, 30 minutes a day. Is that uh, any book or the school providing a, a, a book for resource or would you, would you ask uh, parents? Well, we we encourage students to read 25 minutes per day um, and it can be anything. We just want to expect our students to experience uh, print. Um, and so it can be any um, books, but that's why we encourage um, well, let me let me back up. We if 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 parents want to truly um, get students to read, find out what books that interest them, and then that's the type of books that you will get them. Um, we do that with our book fair. We encourage students to participate. We just had one um, um, last week, um, and so we have those three times uh, a year, just so um, students can get books that they are. Um, interested in once they see material that they're interested in of course they will be more um, acceptable to reading that book um, but the reason that we provide a resource um, we know that students don't always have books at home so we want to make sure that they have some books at home at their level um, at their grade level that they can read with um, we also have of course RAS kids um, which is an electronic um, program and I believe that's up and running. I think all of the students have their logins. If not, you can reach out to the teachers. Um, but that is a, 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 it has a plethora of books on there electronically. Um, so we're just trying to make sure that there's no excuse for a student to, to not have a book to read because we know how powerful and important it is for them to be able to engage in print. Gotcha, thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the answer, appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Rencher, you're up next. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Charles Renter from the middle school. I'm the middle school principal. I just want to share a few updates uh, with you today. Uh, one, we finished our PSAT for the eighth graders, and um, that went well. We, we are sending those, uh, we sent those uh, forms and answer documents out uh, for recording. That's their first introduction to the College Board uh, series of testing. And uh, we are still working on our NWEA. It's a growth measurement. Um, just to find out exactly where the students are right now. So we know exactly where we need to focus um, on this, this school year. So this is um, after 18 months of a non-traditional learning experience that many of us were not prepared for. Um, this is critical. This is a critical year. It's a key bounce back year and we're trying to do that as effectively as possible. Um, another thing is, an, I guess, an announcement. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same at the other buildings, but um, the mask, student masks are a part of their dress code. Um, a lot of students are coming in without a mask, uh, anticipating um, being provided one uh, on a daily basis. However, we do expect that students have a mask when they come in just for their protection and the protection of others. Um, however, we need to make sure that we are well stocked with the mask and sometimes um, it gets a little bit thin. So we wanna make sure that students understand the importance um, and not tearing the masks off um, so we have to reissue some of those as well. Um, we want to make sure that students are aware that this is anti-bullying month and we want to put a, a, a laser-like focus on different aspects of how to interact with one another. We have a few things that we're doing with the students uh, to have smaller group sessions, uh, peer mediation, um, counseling sessions with our counselor, um, peeking in different classes, things like that. So uh, we're putting a, putting a focus on that uh, this year. And I guess last but not least, um, tomorrow we're gonna have a Title I meeting at five o'clock, basically to explain the, the purpose of Title I funding and how we use it at CPA Middle School and possibly get some, um, some suggestions, some ideas from our parents who wanna show up tomorrow and uh, collaborate with us. So that's about it for the middle school. Thanks, Dr. Richard, and I, I thank you again for the uh, parents. Uh, yeah, some schools did ask me to remind parents about the, the masks that they are re required in order to enter the building, and the school only has so many of them. So parents, if you make sure your, your child leaves out that morning that they are equipped with their mask and maybe a backup one in their back pocket or their purse or their book bag, because the school on, does, does not have an unlimited supply of, of masks, but we try to do the best we can to fill in when a student does not enter the door with one. So parents, please help us out by uh, making sure your child has probably, um, like I said, get a mask on them and one in their, either their purse or their backpack or their book bag as a backup just in case it does tear. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Uh, Mr. Erickson, up next, high school. 
All right, good evening, parents. Thank you for attending the meeting. I am Brian Erickson, principal of the high school. A few updates for our building. We do have PSAT testing for 11th graders next Tuesday and SAT testing for our 12th graders next Thursday. If you have a ninth or 10th grade student and they were not able to take the test that we had a couple of weeks ago due to quarantine, those will be made up in the spring. Um, similar case for these two tests, except for the seniors, they would have to schedule a Saturday. So that'll all be done in school, normal release time for the juniors and seniors next week. Nothing you need to do as a parent besides get there, get them on track to have a positive mindset and have um, a good outlook on, on what the test will re result in. A um, couple other things at the high school. We do have our GRIT program beginning on November 3rd. And for those of you unfamiliar, that's 30 minutes every Wednesday we devote to soft skills, social emotional learning, could be anything from how to handle a conflict to how to open your lock to organization. Um, so that's something we'll be having every Wednesday in November going forward in their homeroom class. We also have an inside out program beginning soon, and that's a program where we have a creative writer coming into the high school working with some of our ninth grade students every Monday for about 17, 20 weeks. And at the end of it, they will have finalized one piece of creative writing in a booklet that's going to be a publication that they will have at the end of the school year. So if you have a ninth grade student, they may be participating in it, they may not. Um, there may also be an opportunity next year or the year after, depending on how many creative writers we can actually partner with. And that will be it for the updates for the high school. Any questions, you can type them in the chat. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those who put in, uh, information in the chat. Again, if you have any questions for any of the three principals or our presenter tonight, make sure you please drop those in the chat for us. Uh, there, we do have one, uh, one more announcement I want to bring up. We are uh, the November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Uh, the principals didn't announce it, but we are having a movie night. Uh, and I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, fellas, I think it's for um, each school will be rewarding uh, 180 students who had perfect attendance, I believe. Uh, in the past month or so, they will be the first ones able to uh, participate in that movie night. I think the high school and middle school were watching Black Panther in the back of the parking lot, uh, the all old school drive-in style. So bring your hot chocolate and your popcorn and your brownies and some chicken and bring me some chicken if you don't mind. I like breasts and, and wings personally, but uh, that's a whole nother story. In elementary, I believe they're doing, um, elementary is doing, what is it, Anderson? Uh, Space Jam 2. New Space Jam, New Space Jam. So hopefully uh, your students are one of those students with perfect attendance. So we're gonna try to do things to reward students throughout the course of the district. But I know the elementary, uh, high school day is Wednesday, November 3rd, middle school is Thursday, November 4th, and uh, elementary is November 5th at 6.30 in the back. But you'll get more information on that from the school directly for those 180 uh, kids who had perfect attendance. All right, at this time, no further ado, we're going to bring up Ms. Brooks from JMB Advising talking about uh, your, your opportunity after Channel Park Academy. Once you leave Channel Park Academy, there's something you, but right now we're getting you prepared for that life after, after CPA. And, uh, and parents, I do want you to know it does start at elementary. Uh, you, you, you can't get to where you want to go to when you get to high school. You get to already have that roadmap plan. Uh, for elementary, middle, and high school. And Ms. Brooks is going to help us and get, show us how to get there. Thank you, Ms. Brooks, for joining us. And it's all yours. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I am so excited to be here. Um, again, my name is Mrs. Brooks. Um, and I am coming to you representing JNB Advising. Um, and so tonight's presentation is going to be about helpful tips, suggestions, and resources for parents and scholars. Um, I do recognize that this is K-12, so there will be some things that may be specific to um, more K-8 parents versus high school parents, but hopefully all of it will be things that resonate with you all as parents, as I am one too. And so I'm excited to be able to talk with you all a little bit tonight. So um, just to give a brief overview of who is JMB Advising, um, it is a company that I started 
um, as a black woman, as a mother, as a wife and an educator specifically, um, having been working in K-12 settings since 2012, um, that helped me to create and launch this business. And so I've been doing college advising um, in a K-12 setting since 2014. I've worked with programs such as Upward Bound Trio, um, Safe Play Detroit, which is over here on the east side of the city, um, Create, which also does um, some grant writing um, and college advising for the high school, uh, Community Education Commission, the Boys and Girls Club, and Gear Up. So I've had a lot of experience working with different um, organizations in the community, as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions with students and parents. And so the uh, ultimate goal of my business is to help students and families prepare for post-secondary planning. So things and people that I support in general would be individual students for post-secondary planning, uh, families, so all of you on this call, um, as you are the village that helps to raise your children, curriculum building and programming, so for schools or organizations, and then also um, tapping into areas such as financial aid advising, scholarship support and research, internship and resume preparation, and then assisting students um, or even adults, grad students, things of that nature with personal statement and scholarship essay review. Um, I also like to highlight a mentor moment um, or J&B mentor moments where I try to connect students with uh, professionals and individuals in different areas and career paths that students have an interest in so they can get an inside look in the inside scoop of what that looked like. Um, what it feels like and how it really is to work in that industry. So that just gives you a little bit of a background of who I am and what I do um, in terms of how I'm going to be supporting you all here tonight. So our agenda, um, as I know my time is limited, um, we're going to talk about four main areas. So it takes a village, um, post-secondary planning, utilizing your resources that's both inside and outside of school, and then scholarships and financial support, which will be helpful for my high school parents, but also is great information for my K-8 parents as you all are rearing and raising your younger children to get them ready and prepared for that high school level. Um, and then we'll also take questions and concerns at the end. And then I also have a parent survey that I would love for you all to take a few moments to fill out for me so that I can give feedback to your respective administrators and parent uh, support group. So um, this is a brief icebreaker. Um, and so it's more so uh, to ground you in the work that we're going to do tonight. And so if I have students that are on the call with their parents, um, my question for you, and this is K-8 as well, um, is kind of what is your greatest achievement? Um, and so this is in middle school or in high school. And this could be something that is academic, social, or personal, um, or extracurricular. So that's for my students. And then for my parents, what is your current goal or expectation of your student in high school? Um, and then again, also in K-8 for middle school and elementary. Um, and then what is your role in helping them to achieve that? And so if you want to type responses in the chat as I'm going, that's great. So I can have a chance to look back on those. Um, but I know that it's hard to kind of come off mute as it's a webinar. So I want you all to actively use the chat to type those things in there. So again, for students, your greatest achievement in whatever level of school you're in right now. Um, and then parents, um, since this is more geared towards you, what is your current goal or expectation of your student and what is your role in helping them to achieve that? So just, just a minute of think time for you guys to do that. And then we're gonna keep going with the slideshow. And I can't see the chat while I have this on. So um, I'm excited to see responses that you all may be uh, providing me with once I'm done sharing my screen. And you can feel free to keep typing um, if things come to you uh, from that goal about or the topic of what is uh, your current goal for your student um, and in what areas are you helping them to achieve that goal. So it takes a village. So we've heard this popular phrase. Um, and in this setting, we are the village, right? I'm an outside um, representation of what a village looks like in your community, but you're also here present with one another and then your school administrators, um, as well as the district leader for the parent group. 
So when we're talking about within a school setting, your partnerships start mainly with your teachers first. Um, sometimes teachers create incentives for students to have participation within their classes, um, but that can also spill over into parent uh, participation as well. So those teachers are the um, gatekeepers of their classrooms. They're the leaders. And so you are the leaders of your household. And so when those two groups connect together, um, it creates a strong and powerful force. And so for my students or my teachers, um, extra credit assignments are things that kind of help within the village, maybe motivating students to do their very best. Um, to bring new ideas or creativity to the table. Um, and then there are also opportunities for outreach and collaboration. So as parents, if you're on this call, that means that you're already involved. You want to know what's going on within your child's school. You wanna know who the key players are, people whose names you need to know, um, and people that are gonna get the job done. So it starts within the classroom, but then that administrative support within a school setting is really important. And it's empowering for you as a parent to know who those people are for you to connect with. And so opportunities like this provide options for involvement. So it gives you a space to be able to speak up, to communicate things that may be um, you know, bothering you or things that are also going really well within your school. As much as we may want to discuss sometimes the things that aren't going well, shining a light on positive things within a school setting also helps to engage and create our village to be stronger um, at every level of our children. So K all the way going through 12th grade. Now for parents, when you start talking to your school administration um, and especially to your children, um, because this is more geared for how parents can help to be resources um, and also help to create um, that pathway and that journey for their students, start including that in your expectations. What is your overall goal for your child? And even though we are training them up to have their own opinions um, and to grow and to be their own people, it also starts within our households and then it also spills over into those classrooms because that's where our children spend the most the majority of their time. Um, I have two children. I have a, a college age student started as a freshman um, in an aviation program and I have a second grader. Both of my expectations for them are the same as far as what I want them to do in being successful and being great people, but the, the ways in which they execute them look totally different. And so including or having that as part of your evening conversations with your children are things that have really worked well for me and things that I always use when I'm working with my clients. So I call it intentional time. So after homework is done, you know, there's bath time, um, maybe there are extracurricular activities or hobbies um, that are going on within your household that you are, you know, chauffeuring your children to and from. There's also needs to be some time to talk about goal setting within your household. So creating that intentional space where your child is recapping what happened during their day um, or things that they have coming up that may be, you know, having stress or anxiety, maybe it's a quiz or an exam. Um, or, you know, their weekly homework or daily homework assignments, anything that is related to goals um, or ways that your children are being successful in their school settings. For us as parents, creating that intentional time to talk to them is really, really important. Um, and so another way that um, really helps me to stay organized and on top of everything with my own kids is creating those calendar invitations. So for my oldest, um, he's a part of that. He's a part of the planning of the calendar, things that need to go on there, events that need to take place. Um, and that intentional time is also on the calendar. So we can remember um, to look at the schedule and say, hey, we need to set some time aside tonight to talk about things that are going on with you in school um, or areas and ways that I can support you and help you. Um, if you have you know, an iPhone or even Android, I know that there are, are apps within that where you can set reminders for yourself that your children can be on for the older students. Um, and then also notes to help remind you of that. So for the babies, intentional time looks a little bit different. Um, because, you know, there's a different level of vocabulary and language that you're able to use. But the concept of intentional time to me is important when it comes to using your village um, and creating a space for your children to be able to communicate more with you and you with them. Post-secondary planning going into our second part of tonight. Um, we're talking about all of the different options that our children have. You've got community college for two years. Um, university or college settings that are four years, trade school, military and certificate programs. And all of those have their own uh, respective processes of how they need to be achieved. So you may have program applications, you're going to need some type of school records or transcripts, 
um, if they are planning to attend um, a two-year or four-year university, they're going to need to apply for that free um, application for federal student aid. And then also being proactive as far as contacting um, schools or contacting admissions reps or contacting um, people from extracurricular activities that may have areas or avenues for your students to utilize those extracurriculars to help them get towards their college options. And so when you talk about post-secondary planning, it looks different for all children. Not every student is set on going to college, but every student needs to have a plan. And so as parents, we wanna help cultivate that and help them stay organized and recognize that the choices that they're making, even from a K-8 level going into high school are what help them to provide or be able to have access to options. So even if you lay these options out to your students at a young age, they can go and explore and do different things. Um, they can take different paths and travel and journey through that in different ways. But the vast majority of our students are going to fall into one of these five categories. Um, and so giving them the opportunity to understand and recognize what that is, is a part of your school's role and responsibility, but it also stems from you in conversation. And so this checklist um, is just a way for parents who, regardless of what age level your child is, to understand and recognize that at some point, these are things that are going to need to be discussed. Applying for these programs, making sure that you have the records of the student's um, academic history, completing uh, financial forms to help pay for school, um, and then also being proactive about the communication and the points of contact that are needed to help you be successful with this. In addition to that, um, something that um, can sometimes be an issue when it comes to communication are having working numbers. So sometimes parents or even schools, um, maybe there's a number that changes and there has to be a level of communication that goes back and forth between the two. So we need to make sure that we have working telephone numbers, that we have working emails. Um, you can always request to set up one-on-ones within um, your school system. So whether it's having a one-on-one -on -one with um, the district leader, Mr. Williams, or having a one-on-one -on -one with Ms. Sane, who is a counselor, um, or even now that we're in this virtual world because of the pandemic, having virtual sessions where you're able to connect with someone, um, whether it's in your school setting right now or in one of those post-secondary options to help answer questions and kind of relieve some of that anxiety of, hey, we have this plan, we're trying to you know, take this journey, but we're just unfamiliar with you know, where we need to start or what we need to do. You also have these other platforms depending on your school district. So MyStar, PowerSchool, Zoom, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams. These are all different avenues where if you can't physically get in front of someone and have a conversation with them one-on-one, -on -one, you can utilize one of these things um, or utilize these tools to review your students' grades, to review their schedule, to review what teachers they have so that you can make those contacts and use those telephone numbers, those emails, and the opportunity to have a space that's one-on-one. -on -one. Um, even if you're in a K-8 setting, there is someone on that staff who is dedicated to helping students matriculate um, and go through to and through K-8 in order to get to high school. So who is that person? Um, and making sure that you develop a relationship with them to make sure that your child at a K-8 level is staying on track to get to that high school um, age level and high school uh, work level as well. So utilizing your school resources. So who supports your student? So on this call, I can see the administrators that are present um, who are here to kind of cater to every style of parent. So some of us work nights, some of us work days, some of us don't work at all. Some of us are able to be actively involved um, or were maybe actively involved within the schools prior to COVID, but are doing so in different ways. Now, I saw a parent was trying to donate some masks. These are ways that as parents, we are trying to cater to things that are helpful for our kids. So recognize the people who also are trying to cater to us as the parents, right? Building those relationships with the people in the school system. So if you are not taking time to meet and greet with the teachers, um, or even learn the names of the people who are influencing your child on a day-to-day -day basis, it puts us at a disadvantage as the parent, right? And so when you then have um, communication or when you have questions or concerns, having been able to build a relationship or start building a relationship shifts the energy. 
So it shifts the energy, not only for you and your child, but also for the staff member that you're engaging with. Everybody remaining on the same page as this village is what helps to promote accountability the most. And so it's exciting to have parents who are on here because I recognize that not only have you already tried to, or are you in the process of shifting that energy, but you're attempting to make sure that you are building relationships with the people who have influence within, within your child's life on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes even more so than we do as parents because we are not with them from the hours of 7.30 to 3.30 or whatever your you know, school time frame is. And so, you know, knowing who your layers of support are, are really important in order to utilize those school resources. So you have administration, you have school counselors, you have teaching and support staff, and all of these people have roles within your child's life that you can utilize to help them on this post-secondary plan. So for K-8, it looks different than it does for high school, but at both levels, or all three levels, since your school has three different principles, there is someone that is dedicated to this process. And they are then reaching out to people like me to come in and be able to provide a different lens, a different uh, layer of support to be able to show you that there are other ways as parents that we can step in and help our students with making plans. For my high school parents, this is more specific to things that you may be engaging in right now. But for my K-8 parents, this is also really important for you to start thinking about in pre-planning for your child to be successful. So scholarships are a huge piece for students as they get into that high school age level. Um, the choices that they may have made in K-8 sometimes can follow them going into the high school, but it doesn't have to be the determining factor as to whether or not they can be successful. And so when you start looking at a high school age student and the grades and the extracurriculars and things that they are trying to keep up with or involved in, or maybe even have a job and are working, Applying for scholarships is impactful because it changes the game financially for a student. Um, we all have the best of intentions when it comes to taking care of our kids, but we also know that we all can't afford the education dollar sign that is listed for some of the schools or programs that they may be interested in. And so if you can encourage your child from the very beginning to treat applying for scholarships almost like a full-time job, it helps to shift the mindset for them that if I want this to be an option for me, there's also some work that I have to put in. And so setting a, a scholarship goal amount usually is the first step that I recommend for parents. Um, if you're looking at a two-year or four-year program, there are different layers of support um, from a, the Detroit level um, or a Metro Detroit level area, such as the Detroit Promise, where it encourages students to apply for a two-year university and stay in state and have that tuition paid for. Um, or if you want to stay in state but also do a four-year university, you have to have a certain grade point average um, or a certain SAT score in order to be eligible for that. So setting a scholarship goal helps to put into perspective for the student, how much is that going to cost? Um, how many scholarships should I try to apply for each month? And so even if you have small children, thinking about this ahead of time and recognizing that the seeds that you plant right now are the ones that will remain with them for longer periods of time is very important and it's impactful as well. Um, and then it also helps to promote accountability. So I know as a parent that my son did not always apply to every single scholarship that I sent him. Even though this is my area of expertise, this is what I do, I know that the scholarships will help him in the long run and ultimately save me money. But hoping to help hold him accountable means that I also have to prioritize that and prioritize making him apply for things, sitting down with him, assisting him with reading things. I um, mean, even if you are not in education and that's not your background, your involvement and your support goes a long way um, and starts with you first before it goes anywhere else. Financial aid is a huge piece. So some schools may have something that they call a FAFSA night or a paying for college night. Um, where they may invite financial aid representatives or departments to come in or virtually speak with your students, you too can reach out to those people. So if you are starting to create your plan of what your child wants to do, what they're most interested in, and maybe where they th they're thinking about going next steps after high school is over, you can reach out and have or have your student reach out and communicate to the financial aid department, to the admissions reps, 
Um, and then the biggest piece is having conversations on financial expectations. So a lot of times students go into applying for schools and maybe have not had a conversation with their family, their village on, well, what are the expectations? You, you are co communicating or encouraging me to go to school, but in what areas or ways are you going to support me with that? Some families may not be able to contribute financially to their child's education. And so that's where those scholarships are a key factor in that. The more scholarship money they are able to secure, the less money families have to come out of pocket to pay for. And so students understanding before they even start that process of where they are and where their family is, is really helpful because it sets the tone for how hard a student may work to achieve that goal. Um, and not necessarily being able to um, contribute financially doesn't mean that a parent doesn't want to support emotionally or physically taking them to appointments or taking them to meetings with admissions reps or taking them to go and visit colleges. There are so many ways that we can support our children um, because we're already financially supporting them, right? But this looks different when you're talking about post-secondary. And so no matter how much money you have or how much money maybe you've set aside, you already started planning for your child, um, and wanting them to be able to do something or to hit a goal that you all have discussed, I encourage and implore them to apply for scholarships because who doesn't want free money that they don't have to pay back? Who doesn't want to be able to allow their parents to be able to give them money for things that they want or need versus having to do that for their school, um, for their school ticket? And so um, I think that it's really important for parents to have conversations as a family about the financial aspect of schools, of trade programs, of certificate programs, and what that looks like um, for the student and then for the family. Because if you don't talk about it, then you get to a place where you may not be able to assist because you didn't know what the expectation was or the student was unaware of what the ticket cost was going to be for them to go to the school um, or to complete that particular program. And so it's just really important to make sure that everyone remains on the same page. Um, additional to that, scholarship research is also something that I um, educate my clients or my students or my families on. And so for students, um, and this is even true for middle school students, because you may be looking to complete programs or get them into extracurricular things that may be competitive. So students learning how to build up a resume or going to their counselor when it comes to a resume is important. Listing their academic success, student organizations or activities that they're in. Um, and then as they age and get older, jobs and volunteer work. So some students may be very active in their church community. Um, or the community in which they live. And so these are all different student action items that they can be working on um, because they need to start learning how to talk highly of themselves, right? How to engage someone in a conversation about who they are and then being able to list these things and then discuss them or explain them in more detail is a skill set. Um, and so I heard uh, Principal Erickson talking about that they had this grit time and that's a time where they're teaching students these soft skills um, in areas in which they can grow within that. Well, learning how to talk about themselves, learning how to communicate and express who they are to someone that does not know them, that's a part of that. Um, and it's something that even a K-8 child can do in their own words. And so adult action items when it comes to scholarship research, we have to recognize that as the village, we can't always only put this um, responsibility on our students. And so as parents, we can start researching on social media. We can Google news. Um, the student and the parent can work together to assemble or create a scholarship folder. Um, and that's something that you can start looking at even if, if your child is not a high school age student. It's just good to know what scholarships are out there, um, what organizations may have scholarships that, they, that are renewable, meaning that they give them out every single year. Um, and where a student can have that money to continue to flow in for their post-secondary plan. Um, and then also reaching out to peers, friends, um, people who have um, jobs that are in different uh, industries and staff members to send you scholarships as a parent that you wanna be able to utilize for your student. Um, and so you can create, um, even in your emails, um, a folder where you can house all of that information so that you're not losing it and so that you have access to it when your child is ready um, to start applying. And so that forward thinking, that accountability, 
um, can be a team project that you work on with your student. And so it's not to say that students have to be pushed in one direction or another, but it is to say that you want to be prepared enough to be able to have access to these things so that the financial aspect of it is not a barrier. Um, it's something that actually works in your favor because you've been proactive and you started planting those seeds early. To assemble a scholarship folder, um, like I talked about in the previous slide, you can do it by scholarship type. Um, you can list them as renewable versus non-renewable, meaning that that renewable scholarship is one that the student is going to have access to every single year. Um, whereas a non-renewable, it's a one-time scholarship that the student may receive from an organization. Um, you can organize it by due date. So you can say, well, I know that these scholarships are due in the month of October, November, December, and so forth. You can even list them as national versus local scholarships. Um, and then you can also um, recognize that local scholarships are a major factor in students being able to have access to more money. Um, oftentimes you're going to receive more scholarships from your hometown. So Detroit-based scholarships, um, scholarships for your county, um, those are going to be ones that are going to have either bigger uh, scholarship dollars or be more accessible to you. And it's gonna be based on location, academics, um, and other factors that are specific to students who are from your area. You can also organize the folder um, by categories of sports, um, academics. Maybe your child is a first generation college student um, or student that is pursuing post-secondary planning. Um, underrepresented students, so maybe it's by your race or ethnicity. It could be by ability. Maybe your child has an uh, individualized education plan or an IEP, um, or maybe they have a physical um, disability or an emotional um, disability. Anything that is ability related can also be a scholarship. Um, talents, hobbies, extracurriculars, anything that you can think of that can set your child apart from someone else or highlight something that is special and unique to them is a scholarship that you can organize in your folder. So all of these are different ways that your child can continue to shine and use those soft skill sets to be able to talk about themselves in a way, in an essay that is going to get someone to listen to their story. Um, and I do other sessions that talk about storytelling and things like that, but this is just kind of like the basis of what you can do um, and how you can start preparing yourself to get ready for that level. Community support, there are going to be a lot of supplementary documents that your child is going to need to provide. So essays, letters of recommendation, which can be from key players like the people on this call who know your child, who have a relationship with your child, uh, teachers that they've had who have nice things to say about them and really understand the character of your student. Um, and then also applications and interviews. So there are going to be times where your student might be applying for a competitive scholarship and it requires them to meet with someone in person so that they can make a decision based on how they perceive your child off of the paper that they've written. Um, and so those are going to be things that a community is going to be uh, there to help. Um, that village support is going to be present for that student in making sure that they recognize who they are. Um, the goals that they have set with their parent or their village as a whole, um, and then pursuing it and going after it. And that is also a part of them growing up. Um, and so all of us at some point had to do that. We had to interview for something, we had to apply for something, and we had to show someone why we were the best candidate. And so this is going to be true for our children as well. Um, and then other uh, supplementary resources, so corporate scholarships. So, you know, you may um, shop a lot at Walmart or Target, um, there are scholarships that those companies may have for students, um, whether the student works there or just scholarships in general. Um, churches, um, if you are active and involved in a church community, churches give out a lot of scholarship dollars as well. And sometimes you don't have to be a member of the church to be eligible for it. You have nonprofit organizations, um, sororities and fraternities. I was in a sorority or I'm still in my sorority. Um, from undergrad and so Delta Sigma Theta gives a scholarship every year they give it by region they give it by county they give it by city um, and so that's a scholarship that sometimes can be renewable or non-renewable um, but uh, if you don't apply for it you don't have an opportunity to receive it at all so um, and then the institutional ones come from the, the colleges themselves so as your student is applying 
for a school, um, there are going to be opportunities that they may receive additional scholarships based on their merit or their academic work, um, their volunteer work, um, their overall application as a whole, their test scores. And so looking at the websites and doing some research to see, because they're going to list the scholarships on there, which ones are available um, and what your student can benefit from in a school selection that they're choosing for post-secondary planning. Um, this is my contact information. Um, again, my name is Mrs. Brooks. If you would like to contact me, you are welcome to send me an email. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. For my students, I also post scholarships for them on a regular basis on my Instagram page. It's an easy way for them to find the information. They can go directly to the flyer or the um, organization that's sponsoring the scholarship. I have a Facebook page. I put flyers um, and information on there as well. And then I also have a website. Um, and so all of these are ways that I do not mind people contacting me or communicating with me. And then I also have the survey that will be put in the chat for you all. Um, so just give me feedback on things that you enjoyed about the presentation, maybe something that you didn't think about prior to um, as far as working with your child on their post-secondary plan. Um, and if welcome back, I would love to come and present again on a different topic that would be helpful to your student body and your parent population. And I'm going to stop my share because I think my time is up. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. We really appreciate that presentation. Um, I think that when you sum it all up, we need to just begin with the end in mind. Um, you have heard all of the administrators on this line talk about uh, that we're in the thick of testing. Um, and even looking at middle school, PSAT, all those things matter when you're trying to plan um, for what it's gonna look like by the time they reach their senior year and what they're gonna do once they leave Chandler Park Academy. So um, Mr. Williams, we're gonna turn it back over to you. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Brooks, for presenting. Yes, thank you again, Ms. Brooks, uh, for presenting. We definitely have you back. You share with us a wealth of knowledge. I mean, a wealth of knowledge uh, and that it was a 25, 30 minute burst of energy. <laughs> so thank you again for coming tonight. Miss Saying, I totally forgot you were supposed to uh, present Ms. Brooks. And, uh, <laughs> I got caught up in talking. I said, oh, I forgot Ms. Saying. So thank you, Ms. Saying, for coming tonight. This is our uh, high school career and scholarship counselor. She works very closely with the high school and middle school. And we're trying to do work with the elementary as well because we, we are, we're learning more and more that this process starts at the elementary. That's the foundation of it. And then it comes up from there. Uh, so let's see what. Parents, if you got any questions, comments, concerns, please add them into the chat. I'm going to try to go back up and see uh, what we have here. Let me go all the way back up. Okay. Okay, let's see. So Ms. Jones, you asked a question about why we don't put the, um, the vaccinated kids and the unvaccinated kids in different buildings. It's, it's just not enough. It's, it's the, the vaccinated kids is just a small population of kids that are vaccinated. So it's just, it's just not, not logistically possible for us to be able to uh, uh, put those probably two classes of students in a separate building. But that's pretty much all, all it is. Uh, you know, it's uh, six to twelve. Six to twelve grade students are eligible for the vaccine. I think it's twelve to eighteen now, uh, but there's only a small number of students who uh, have received the vaccine. And if you, if, if your child has received the vaccine, they are allowed to come back to school. Uh, they don't have. They do not have to quarantine. So again, it, where it's, people's uh, have their own choice. But if you want your child to be able to not have to come in and out during quarantine, something we can we cannot control. But we're doing our best to try to uh, limit the spread inside the school. Uh, this is being brought into the school, not in the school. It's been brought to the school. But if your child is vaccinated, then they don't they don't have to quarantine. Um, so thank you, Ms. John, for your, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Richardson, Ms. Armstrong, for your comments to Ms. Brooks about your your child's current goals and your 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 role in the support. Uh, 
as Ms. Sain said, we have, we, we're Channel Park is not a part of Detroit Promise, but there is a plethora, as Ms. Brooks mentioned, a, a, a number of ways opportunities are, it's, it's more money out there than, than it is kids. I mean, it's, it's so much money, so much opportunities, and we try to present that to your parents so you can know exactly what your child is eligible for and get you started on the right track early, as early as elementary. So it's so much money out here that, that students can, can literally go to school for free more than we've ever had, including our dual enrollment program, which starts, starts in ninth grade, where students can earn their associate degree by attending to 12th grade and cut your tuition in half. So I don't know how, as a parent, you do not take advantage of that opportunity to have your child. Uh, Ms. Armstrong can, can attest to that. She's on the call tonight as her child uh, graduated from Michigan State within two years because she had associates when she went to Michigan State and now has an internship and has a, 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 a job offer before she even she even graduated already for astronomical amount of money. I'm making, making more than me. So I'm, I'm so proud of her, but she took advantage of that dual enrollment program. Uh, so parents, if you're in middle school, high school, please look forward to that dual enrollment program. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Well, thank you again for parents for coming. If you have, if you remember, yes, dual enrollment begins in ninth. That does it begin in ninth grade, Miss Sain? Dual enrollment. So dual enrollment begins the summer after ninth grade year. Okay, so Miss Richardson, yeah. you would need to. I'm pretty sure you. I think your son is in ninth grade. Uh, you need to see Miss Sain then, yeah, because it, it begins that summer. So this this upcoming summer. Is when they start, I think, with a science class, I believe, something like that. But that's that's when the process starts. So the same should be getting information out to the students, those ninth grade students this year, to get them see who's uh, who wants to apply for that. Okay. All right, parents. If you got any other questions, concerns, you always have my email. Ms. Go ahead, Miss. I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mr. Williams. What we want to do is we do want to give parents the opportunity to complete the survey. Yes. And how? how um, Ms. Brooks, so, um, Ms. Brooks is going to put the link to the survey in the chat. So we're just going to ask parents if you can please take a moment and complete yes, that survey. Please do. Also, um, there is a scholarship document that when we send this out, we can attach that uh, document so you can have just another plethora of scholarships to put in your folder. All right, parents, before you go, please take the time to fill out the survey for us. We definitely need to hear your voice, and Ms. Brooks does as well, so we can prepare and plan for uh, another uh, session. Thanks for your time. And I do see the question about dual enrollment. So at this time, the dual enrollment program, it is for, it, it's work towards them completing an associate's degree. And some of the students, don't you know complete the actual associate's degree but they can take those courses and all of those credits can go towards their either associates or their bachelor's program we are working on trying to get something um for the trades right and we, and we are we are our college and career prep high school so i'm gonna have to get miss um miss miller on here who's the director of cte we do have a lot of cte opportunities for students who want to go to skilled trade Miss saying, I don't know, we got three or four programs we work with that will get students jobs right after graduation, but also they work in the summertime while they're in high school. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Hall, we definitely got that in place. I'm gonna have to get Ms. Miller on here to kind of to talk about how many opportunities we have for students in school as well as out of school. Uh, even for adults, even for parents who need a job, uh, these, these, these trade programs that we partner with can uh, help our parents uh, find work as well. So we'll definitely give you more information on that. Everyone, please click in and fill out that survey so Ms. Brooks can have the information and we can dialogue about what you share. Other than that, have a good night and we'll see you in November. Thank you so much for having me. Everyone be blessed. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Thanks for coming. My pleasure.